due process, winner of 25 regional Emmy Awards. Due process is a presentation of Rutgers University, Newark, and Rutgers Law School in Newark. So you have a brother that come out. If he comes out, he has no money, he can revert right back to what he used to do. Or the, at least 90% of the time, that's what's gonna happen. He gonna revert back to that. But if he has a job, something to come to. To come to from places like this, hoping for a way to stay outside these walls, a way that may become easier with some new state laws to make a criminal record far less of a barrier. Where are you guys from? The struggle for successful re-entry. New help, new hope. On this edition of Due Process. A job, a place to live, relationships, money, issues that we all at times may find difficult to handle. But now imagine you're just out of prison with none of those in place. How to make your way in a world where you have no preparation, no prospects, no peace, without returning to the life that put you behind bars in the first place. I'm Sandra King, and on this edition of Due Process, the daunting problem of prisoner reentry. And if you don't believe how surely we're failing on reentry, Check the stats. Two-thirds of all who leave lockup wind up back within three years. Or you could talk to anyone who's been in and found out how hard it is to come out. You don't know where to look. You don't know where to turn. You don't know who to ask. To begin, you need housing and a job. Both of those elusive if you're coming out of lockup. Add lack of skills or past employment. Any weapons and drugs on you? The history of addiction and crime. My whole life was circled around getting high. And the systems stacked against you, even if you leave jail or prison with the will to change. When you're in the county, and I'm going to do this when I get out, I'm going to do that, I'm going to do right. But when that door opened up and you're walking down that ramp, what you going to do then? It's a story we've heard again and again. And the door's already been slammed in my face. I've been dealing with that for almost a year in the halfway house. In two decades of covering prisons and inmates, both inside the walls Heroin. and out. You make a change, it's got to be 100% change. The job is just the start. Those characteristics that you felt and you knew were criminal or criminal addictive behavior, you have to really shed yourself for that. Because 95% of those who go in will come out, and two-thirds of them will be back within three years. Some because they don't know another way. They came right back out and got high the same day. But others because they can't find another way. By us having a record and not being able to get certain jobs, that's going to keep us with criminal minds, because we have to find a way to eat. We have to find a way to survive. Go back to my old ways, get back on the streets, get back on the corner. Reentry is not just um, employment, but job training, reinventing the oneself. Is there enough job training available? Well, no. But there's more help than there used to be when most who came home were on their own and left to fail. Getting locked up, coming home, you have nothing. The word re-entry to describe the transition from the cell block to the street was barely known before the 90s when nonprofits like the New Jersey Institute for Social Justice embraced the concept and the word. You've done your time, you've been released, you're home, and this is what I'm trying to do now to get my life back on track. It's an awareness that spread in the last 20 years to even law and order politicians, even the last New Jersey chief exec. Clean up that past wreckage of their lives. And another past governor, whose own fall to grace has fueled his new life's work. I am that woman in jail. I'm no different. 
What wasn't a priority when he governed from the State House Where are you guys from? is now the passionate commitment of Jim McGreevy. A guy or a gal, when they're coming out behind that wall, begin to think about, all right, what are those job opportunities? Where can I make an application? What began as part of his new approach to life and work, a job in Jersey City government, has turned into a major well-funded initiative with seven centers and 1,700 re-entering clients, yes, like yes. Keyshawn Nettles. You won't go back. No. Whose re-entry support began soon after his arrest, continued through a prison stint, and offered welcome and work when he got out. I'm a supervisor at Staples. I drive forklifts. And I've been there for almost 10 months. How'd you get that? Mr. McGreevy's program. The program works? Yes, it does. Very much so. Everyone needs to help hand. Exonerated after 17 years of wrongful imprisonment, Rodney Roberts, like most returning inmates, felt lost. I came home vindicated, as you say, with the with skill set, with a bachelor's degree in logistics. I came home fully loaded, but I still need a help hand. And nothing is needed more or harder to get than the all-important job, as we've seen again and again as we've covered reentry. If you've done any hiring, no? Okay. Thanks a lot. But there has been progress in the last two decades. His urine today was clean. The special courts for addicts. My addiction problem, I knew I had to address that. I signed up for drug court. They hooked me up with a program. What's going on with Mr. Martin? Newark's pioneering community court. I'm going to have to give Mr. Martin a hand clap. It's a miracle. About time. More efforts at reentry starting inside jails and prisons. It's hard for ex-offenders to get a job out there, you know? Even in cities where a large percentage have been behind bars, a city office of reentry would once have been unthinkable. Now it's increasingly commonplace, pioneered by cities like Jersey City and Newark. With the reentry program in Newark, with the mayor got going on now, it's, it's a blessing. But not everyone gets to a program. Not everyone gets a job or a decent place to live. The success story is still outweighed by the failures. I never owned a credit card or nothing like that, so it feels good to have that be a member of society. But maybe enough to point the way. The work I'm doing now, man, is, is like, keeps me clean. It keeps me humble. No more crime. No repeat offender. No, no, no. So it's possible to break the cycle. Yes, it is. Absolutely. But Kishan is the first to tell you he's had a lot of help. Thanks, he says, to this man, former Governor Jim McGreevy, whose New Jersey Reentry Corporation may be setting a new standard for breaking the cycle, while Ryan Haygood's New Jersey Institute for Social Justice is breaking new ground in advocating for programs like Jim's and in challenging the ongoing barriers to effective reentry. Two of the smartest guys I know taking on the really tough problem of what to do about coming out of prison in a permanent way. But Jim, let me start with your own coming out. Out of the state house, out of the closet, into a very new and different life, into your own second chance? Sure. Um, Sandy, th there is a lot um, of emotional, psychological, for me personally, um, adherence, uh, attachment, sort of, and but just candidly, I had so much help and so much support in terms of family. So, but I, I, I think by virtue of my own experience, I have a little, God willing, a little more sympathy for um, the men and women that I work walk, work with who who come out of prison after 15 and 20 years, and the world has changed. Um, certain cases, their families have moved on, uh, they don't have a home, they don't have a job, uh, they don't have health care, uh, they don't have access to lawyers, they can't get an identification, and this incredible fear about how life has changed so dramatically, and somehow they have to navigate all these disparate systems. They do. Mm -hmm. And it's just, I mean, it, it's, I often, I say this every day, that their courage um, their fortitude gives me a, a personal sense of faith and hope and the, and the resilience of the, of the human spirit. So, Ryan, what is your take on how we're doing with reentry? We've been talking about it for decades. We have done 
so little. <clears throat> Where are we? New Jersey is interesting, Sandy, because it is at once a state that has seen a lot of legislative reform around trying to empower people with criminal convictions who are coming home. So there was a robust but? second chance legislation package that was passed that was really intended to help people get some certain amount of uh, um, education and along with that ID before they left prison. There was, as you know, an uh, initiative led by the Institute and a number of partners around banning the box that sought to prohibit employers from really considering criminal convictions as they interview for employment positions. But at the but same they, time... But they could consider it under the Ban the end, Box. They sure. could consider it on the back end. For sure. And that's the other side of it. So New Jersey is at once a state that has had a lot of legislative reform in the reentry space, but it's also a state in which on the books there are more than 1,000 legally imposed barriers to reentry. Oh. 600 of those impact employment. And so if you think about sort of to the governor's point, the way home from prison, if those 1,000 legally imposed impediments are the road, it is a road that is really sort of littered with potholes and it's very difficult to navigate a safe way home if you've got that many barriers in front of you. Or even, I think, to believe that there is somewhere to turn to. Yeah. How do you get that message out, Jim? So thank you. I mean, that's a real challenge. And, and we're looking to work with uh, Governor Murphy and his team in sort of addressing some of those breaks in the system. Uh, you know, Governor Christie was really supportive of the New Jersey Reentry Corporation, along with then Speaker Prieto and, God willing, Speaker Coughlin and, and President Sweeney in, in establishing these sites. So now we have eight sites. But we need to interlock systems so much closer so that when Jim McGreevy is coming out of Northern State Prison and I'm returning to Camden or I'm returning to Jersey City, I'm being given a packet in my process that says, all right, these are the things that you have to do. You need to go to 398 Martin Luther King to be able to qualify for your general assistance. Here's where you go for your housing. And so we have to create that system more smoothly, if you will. Our clients come from... Uh, max outs and you know we, we need to grapple with this is that we have a disproportionate number of persons compared to the national average who max out that means serve the entirety of their length of sentence and when you you know Sandy when you max out you walk out with virtually nothing don't let the door hit you on the backside and you're literally I, I saw a kid a, a young guy today at, at Martin Luther King who had literally maxed out. He was walking in the McDonald's. He didn't, he, was, he got out 10.30 last night and he had nothing, nothing. And he was trying to, uh, you know, I'd figure out where his child's mother was. And so that we need to create these systems. So what we do at the reentry center, whether it's, it's connecting people to housing, which is so critically important, but to be able to have housing, you need to have general assistance. To be able to have general assistance, you need an ID. And so we have a volunteer network of 73 lawyers to the Young Lawyers Division all throughout the state of New Jersey helping to clean, out, clean up warrants so that when I walk out of Northern State Prison, I might have a warrant in Orange, a warrant in Jersey City. I need to clean up those warrants before I can get an ID so I can get the ID so that I can go to the one stop so that I can file the employment papers, so that I can get general assistance, so that I can get emergency assistance to get housing. And how would anybody do that alone? Like, you know, forget it. Forget it. I mean, like, you know, candidly, when I, when I was in seminary, I was up, worked at Exodus in Harlem, and I remember working with somebody who had a, a Department of Corrections ID trying to get Social Security. And, and Ryan, I'd like to think that I'm a peace-loving person, Sandy. I was ready to like, you know, it, it's, it's so difficult because you have all these systems that are linked that have many cases, conflicting requirements, um, different schedules, different locations. And so what we do at the Reentry Corporation is we bring them all together so that they appear before the client. We exist for that client. But how in God's name does anybody think that anybody without a car, without money, without a job is going to get their health care, get legal care, be able to get an ID, get housing and get employment. It's, it's not happening. No, no one that I know with the greatest of God's gifts is going to be able to do this, let alone somebody who doesn't even have bus fare. And, and don't so forget about child support. And child support, which is like a whole like another nightmare. Someone who's not been able to make more than how much do you make, $7 a day? Uh, yeah. Um, and and, and in, the meantime, in the meantime, because their lawyer, through no fault of them, didn't file for atonement of their child support payments, they walk out 
They walk out and their child support payments is incredible. It's through the roof. Right. And they they either walk into a motor vehicle where there's a police officer and somebody obviously sees that there's a warrant because they didn't provide for child support and they get arrested. And, you know, it's like sticky paper. This system doesn't exist to make people whole. This system exists for the purpose of the systems and it constantly brings people back. And so, you know, I'm hopeful with, you know, Ryan's leadership and the Institute's been out there day in and day out and he's much more rational than I am. And then, you know, with, with the Murphy administration and with corrections, with the attorney general and, and parole to start like looking at some of the breaks in the system mm -hmm. where people literally fall into a chasm. And, you know, say, for example, the example you just pictured, you know, somebody comes, they want to see their child. The mother properly calls up and says, oh, he's here. He hasn't paid child support in eight years or eight months. He's picked up. All of a sudden he's back in county jail. He's violated a term of his parole. And now you're looking at the potential of a revocation proceeding. I mean, it's like, this is insane. Yeah, well, I think what the governor is pointing to really is sort of a conceptual problem with how we think of reentry. So if you think about the parallel in a hospital, you know, hospitals begin preparing to discharge a patient on the day that the patient is admitted. And too often in our yeah. context, in the incarceration context, we start preparing to the extent we do at all for a person to leave prison once they're leaving prison. And that really is far too late. And so what I really love about the work that the governor is doing, what I think is a cautionary tale for our broader body of reentry work, is to start thinking about reentry as we do in the hospital context, where the day that a person goes into prison is the day that we start thinking about what reentry looks like. But you know, like. the incentive, not for people like you guys, but the incentive for the society for doing that in the hospital sure. is the insurance companies don't want to pay. Sure. Yep. Try to convince the populace in New Jersey or across the country that in fact it is something that works for them mm -hmm. to not allow people to come out, fail within three years and go back in. Well, and the argument could be uh, is, is that Sandy, that the people, the individuals that are on parole, people that are engaged in our system have a lower recidivism rate than the person who just maxes out and tries to do this on their own. And so whether it's Matt Platkin in the governor's council office or Pete Camerano in terms of governor's, uh, the chief of staff, these guys who have been in government understand that, if, that we have the best practices. We have the evidence that shows if you support a person returning society with housing, with health care, with employment and training, and link them to services to enable them to succeed, that's a lot better than a guy walking out having no food, no money, no access, and eventually, you know, people don't understand this. I've gone to job fairs and my guys need work today. And people are like, well, you have to file this form and we have to look at this. I mean, like, if you don't eat today, the corner selling drugs is your only option. And so when, when Ryan's talked about in the, in the first question, you said, you know, the, the encumbrance is about getting a job. You know, business needs to understand they have to be part of this solution. Because if you don't give people employment, you're going to condemn them to that corner. Of course, the yeah. downside on coming out on parole is that you're also facing a lot of restrictions. Oh, yeah. And you're returning to your community, you're returning to your family, you're returning to your friends. Are you really going to be able to walk that very narrow line? Mm -hmm. But I want to ask you, Ryan, you're the idea guy. Jim has become the action guy. Mm -hmm. What are the ideas and how do we sell them mm -hmm. to the legislature, to the new governor, and to the people who cast their votes and influence so much? Well, one of the things I think that New Jersey lawmakers are especially proud of is that we have experienced some really progressive sort of momentum in the criminal justice space. So the prison population, both the youth prison population and the adult prison population has declined by 50%. And I think that speaks to New Jersey really wanting to move in a direction that's away from mass incarceration. But even as we've seen that significant decline in the prison population, to your point in the opening part of the pr program, the recidivism rate is still striking. And part of what I think we have a chance to capitalize on is there's been meaningful progress in the right direction away from mass incarceration. But we've not yet figured out this reentry piece, do, right. which is a significant driver of incarceration. So one of the challenges, Sandy, is, is how do you become part of this employment? Like, you know, the, a job is, is so critically important. And for our guys that are coming out, they can't go back to public high school because they're over the age of 18, they've been incarcerated, and no, 
but the public schools don't want to know them. And so adult learning is so critically important. And, and whether it's you know, Reverend Stephanie Bartley or, or Reverend Jefferson, we've talked about workforce development and job training. What, a, what somebody needs is an industry recognized credential, whether it's an HVAC license, whether it's CDL, whether it's OSHA, so that they can show the, the 25 story building that they can maintain this building and, for 20 years. And again, years. you can't do that on your own. You can't do that on your own. And that's why we need dollars in the Department of Labor, workforce development dollars. But back to this idea of starting from the beginning. Mm -hmm. um, one of the things that Keyshawn um, told me about Jim's program is that from the time he was in jail, before anything else happened, before he got sent to prison, that they were working with him, and there was already a plan. Yeah. Yeah. Are you able to do that with everyone? Well, we, you know, and, and Commissioner Lanigan has been very good about allowing us into uh, the state prison and so that we can recruit, but we'd almost like this to be automatic. So for the Kishans of the world who want to change their life, who want to do the next right thing, I mean, it works great, but we'd also like it to be almost automatic in terms of that linkage behind the wall, and that hasn't happened. Yeah, and I would just say to the governor's point, part of what we have to do in New Jersey is to get real about what is real. So the Institute, as I mentioned, along with a lot of partners, worked hard to pass the ban the box legislation. And what we learned from a number of folks who were very excited about what that meant for them was that they applied for a job, they got through the interview successfully, they even got the job offer and the start date, and then but came the background check. That's correct. At which point both the offer and the start date were walked back. And so part of what we have to do is assess the meaningful strides that have been made toward empowering people when they come home. But, but it's made but a tease difference. tease out what's right. real. It has made a difference. I mean, I'll, I'll just tell you with the building trades, with the carpenters or the laborers or Senator, Senator Cunningham's legislation, it's made a difference because they've said to me themselves, when, when Jim would apply and I had a felony conviction, I was put in the pile, not considered. Now the reality is, is all the major building trades in this state, it, it's the fact that you have a felony conviction, mm -hmm. it's virtual, it is irrelevant. And, th and th that th happened because of this right. legislation. So, and this may yeah. speak to engaging a broader, a broader audience of employers. Yeah. And so, there, you know, say for example, you know, we work with the building trades, we work with New Jersey businesses, but now you have a, a company, Large Box Retail, whose headquarters is in Omaha, Nebraska. I go to the local branch manager who may want to hire Jim, but policy, the HR policies that are done in Nebraska is no felons. Boom. That's where we need. Candidly, the strength of a governor to call on these CEOs and say, look, it, if you're going to do business in New Jersey, you have to be willing. I said hire one ex-offender. Mm -hmm. Let me talk about mm -hmm. another uh, area that I know you've been involved with at the Institute and full disclosure, I sit on that mm -hmm. board, uh, and that is the idea of voting mm -hmm. when you are still um, under sentence, which means you could be paroled, you could be on probation, and you still can't vote. You'd like to go even further. I would. You know, this is an important issue that I don't think gets an, enough attention. The governor, I've talked a bunch about this, but in Maine and Vermont, yep. people who are in prison can cast they their ballots vote by absentee ballot. That's right. And I think they are empowered to vote on the premise that you don't lose your voting rights by virtue of a criminal conviction. You're always a citizen. You're always empowered with the fundamental right to vote. Any chance that, we've got about a minute and a half left here, any chance that you're going to make any uh, headway on Absolutely, this Absolutely, Sandy. So on February 26th, uh, the um, Senator Ronald Rice, Senator Sandra Cunningham, and Assemblywoman Shavonda Sumter will introduce a bill that will seek to enfranchise right. 100,000 people who are on parole, uh, probation, and in prison. Realistic chances. Realistic chances. I think we, we have a very good chance as we build a ground of support from the ground up in our communities who are really focused on empowering people with the right vote. We know from studies, from research, that people who can vote with criminal convictions have lower recidivism rates, are less likely to go back into the prison system. And voting is a treating, rehabilitative treating act for sure. people like people. Yeah. And finally, we've got one minute left, Jim, but I, I, I've got to go back to where we started this conversation with uh, someone who's turned on the TV and sees us sitting here and hears what you're saying. How do they square that with the young, very ambitious governor whom they knew, and now here is a humble guy who says, I want to serve. Well, my father would say I have a lot to be humble about. But um, <laughs> no, it's just, you know, this is a long, circuitous route, but this is where I think I was always meant to be, and I'm blessed. And it's just, Sandy, 
you know, people say, well, why should we invest? This is 1% of the population. I would argue that whether it's their families, whether it's education, whether it's healthcare, whether it's economics, they were born and they were raised sometimes in the most dire of circumstances. And prison should not be the end all. Everybody's coming home. Let's help them mm -hmm. reach, achieve their better angels. And while I hate to have to leave it there, with my thanks to Ryan Haygood and Jim McGreevy, that is it for this edition of Due Process, but not for reentry. It's a critical issue we've returned to again and again in the last two decades because you can't fight crime or save the lives of ex-offenders without effective prisoner reentry. For producer Tanya Bentley and all of us here at Due Process, I'm Sandra King. Till next week, thanks for watching. That was great. Absolutely. See, the barriers are there, you know what I mean, for you to get over. And sometimes they're there for you to fail. Like for me, it took me, when I first got out, it took me about four and a half months to find a job. You don't know where to look. You don't know where to turn. You don't know who to ask. Not just um, employment, but job training, reinventing the oneself, putting themselves in a position where they dress different, where they learn different um, um, soft skills. Without all that? I would have been either back on drugs again, um, abusing lifestyle on the street a lot. I wouldn't have had no direction. They gave me direction. And I'm grateful for it because I'm happy now. I'm very happy. Want even more insight on law and justice? Become a fan of Due Process on Facebook. Follow us on Twitter and watch us on demand on YouTube.